What is going on guys, my name is John and welcome back to yet another video. Throughout the history of the Pokemon games, glitches have been heavily present, with some of them going as recent as Pokemon Sword and Shield, which has been out for a little over two months as of the date this video goes out. There are tons of glitches that we can go over, but in this video we're going to take a look at some of the unintended tricks that you can do in Generation 3. Today we're going to find out how easily you can glitch Pokemon Emerald. Now before we hop into all the neat little tricks and bugs that are scattered across the Hoenn region, I want to say that although I normally go in chronological order for most of the games that I do for my series, I think it's time to switch it up a bit. If there's a specific game that you'd like me to cover in the future for glitches, feel free to leave a comment below. The next glitch video I'll do will be whatever the top comment is, as long as the game has a decent list of glitches available. Without further ado, let's just get right into it. The first glitch we're going to take a look at is going to be only possible in the Japanese versions of the game. Because the Pokemon games didn't used to have an international simultaneous release date, there was a small window of time during the localization process that made it possible to fix some of the initial bugs in the games. Because this is probably like a 1 month window out of an 8 month difference, there are going to be quite a few glitches that slip through the cracks, but we'll get more into that in a bit. The first location we're going to want to go to is Lily Cove City, and then surf on the water to access the Aqua Hideout. If you make your way all the way to the end of the area where you fight Aqua Admin Matt and watch Archie ride off with the stolen submarine, you can surf on the small body of water. The most obvious thing that you'll notice is that part of the water has that same dark color that's used when you dive to access secret areas of the overworld. If you try to interact with it by pressing A or using one of your Pokemon, it will tell you that you can't dive here. This makes sense because it's not supposed to go anywhere, but if you save on the water and reset, you can go into your party and the dive will actually work, which will then bring you to… Petalburg City? Now this bug works the way that it does for a few reasons. There isn't a lot of information about this one, but I believe that the traits for the dark water are set once you go through the teleporter, and since the game is reloaded without walking through it, the information for the dive water isn't updated. It could also have to do with the fact that you're already in the water when you reset, but why in the world does it teleport you to this random house? In a lot of cases in other Pokemon games, the warp to this house could be the first location on the list of all warps, which would then make it the default choice if the water has no warp info on where it's supposed to go. That still raises the question as to why this is the first one, but someone could have totally set this as the exit as a placeholder. For those curious, this doesn't work in Ruby and Sapphire because the hideout is blocked after you collect the badge in the Moss Deep City, which is the gym that allows you to dive. Let's check out the next one. The next few that we're going to look at are a lot less impactful than the last one, but I felt that I should mention them anyways. During the quality control testing of these games, there were some areas of the game where collision data wasn't properly checked, which then resulted in some tiles being either accessible or not accessible. The two locations that are currently known are the Mirage Tower and the Setopolis Gym, and both of them have opposite effects. On this floor of the tower, the tile behind the stairs is treated like there's a boulder there, while the tile behind the stairs in the gym is accessible, which then allows you to walk into the side of the wall. This doesn't have any major effect in the game, and it's also pretty uncommon that someone would walk there anyways, so I can only imagine a few people have ever encountered this problem before. I will note that the stairs will stop working until you step on a legitimate floor tile, but since they're right next to the stairs, it's a pretty easy fix. The final oversight that we're going to look at for this game is right at the beginning of the game. During the transition from Ruby and Sapphire to Emerald, the Pokemon movers in the game were changed from Machoke to Vigoroth, pushing all the boxes around. But in the Japanese versions of the game, they forgot to change the cry. This means if you talk to Vigoroth, they'll sound like Machoke. Maybe they're just in a costume. Moving forward, let's check out some glitches that can help you in your playthrough. If we head to the Battle Frontier and go into the Battle Tower, we can perform probably one of the most infamous glitches that this game has to offer. As most of you know, the lobbies to all these buildings have the same layout. A counter to register for the challenge, and a PC to change your Pokemon and items. In order to pull this glitch off, we're going to need to deposit a Pokemon into one of the empty boxes and then save in front of the PC. From here we can withdraw the Pokemon that we just deposited and then walk over to the clerk that's standing at the counter closest to the PC. She'll ask if you want to set up a Link multi-battle room. After going through the steps, she'll ask if you want to save your game, which will then result in an oddly long pause before the start menu comes up. If you reset the game at this point, the game will tell you that the save file was corrupted and that it will revert to a previous save. Oddly enough, you'll appear right in front of the clerk even though you didn't save, and if you head back to the PC, the Pokemon that you deposited will be both in the PC as well as your party. This can be used to effectively clone your Pokemon over and over again, and I believe that you can use it to clone your items stored in your PC as well. 
The reason why this glitch works is because the specific clerk automatically saves the data for your party and your bag even if you choose no when it asks you to save. I believe this has something to do with the way the game has to connect with another game through a link cable, but as a result you can do this an unlimited amount of times. The timing for this can be a little odd, so there is a good potential you could lose a Pokemon during the process, so if you're ever interested in doing this, I'd advise going to it expecting you might lose a Legendary or a favorite Pokemon on accident if you time it incorrectly. On a side note, I tried this when I was like 10 and I read the instructions wrong and during the saving process, I shut off my DS during a long pause. And then when I booted it back up, it completely erased my save file. So yeah, don't do that. The final Emerald exclusive glitch that we're going to look at is the most unique, but also the most extensive, the Pomeg glitch. The process of this glitch is very simple. All you need is a Pomeg berry and a Pokemon with low HP. For those who don't know, the Pomeg berry was introduced with a set of other berries with the exact same purpose. When you feed a berry to your Pokemon, the item will increase the Pokemon's friendship, but it will then decrease the amount of effort values the Pokemon has in a specific stat by 10. The purpose of this item is essentially to reset your EVs if you ever want to use a specific Pokemon competitively, and the Poic Berry is used to lower the HP EV stats that your Pokemon can have. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. If you have a Pokemon with some HP EVs, and then bring its health down to 1 HP, and then use a Poic Berry on it, it will remove the 10 EVs, which will then drop its health down by another 2 points. Because the game doesn't see it as a negative number, the game sees it on the other end of the spectrum, and displays it as 65,535 HP out of however many hit points that you actually have. While the specific glitch doesn't have any major effects to the game, the Pomeg glitch opens up the door to a bunch of very… interesting visual bugs. The most obvious thing you can do is roam around the overworld with a team of completely fainted Pokemon. If you go into the battle, we can send out… Uh, this. This is actually the placeholder for Pokedex entries that you haven't seen yet, and if you know what you're doing, you can manipulate the party menu to the point where you can execute code. There's a ton of stuff that you can do with this, to the point where I could explain this for hours, but the most common things that you can do are change specific Pokemon in your PC, change coordinates, and even activate events like the Eon Ticket. There's a whole bunch that you can do because you can just rewrite the game's coding, so I'll link a bunch of stuff in the description if you want to learn more about it. Another strange thing you can do with the Pomeg glitch is that if you only have an egg as the only alive Pokemon in your party, you can go into battles and teach your Pokemon how to battle before it's even born. The egg will have the same stats and moves that it would have when it actually hatches, and believe it or not, it can actually earn experience. If you get an egg with a Pokemon with a low enough level, you can evolve the Pokemon before it even hatches. The downside to this glitch is that even if you do spend all that time trying to train it up, everything is reset back to normal once the egg finally hatches. But if you do evolve it while it's an egg, it will hatch as that Pokemon. The last thing that I want to note about this glitch is that if you get into a battle with animations on, you can encounter some pretty strange effects. If your Pokemon disappears from the screen, the game will sometimes combine your Pokemon's sprite with your opponent's move animations. You uh, you okay there Rayquaza? Let's check out some other stuff. So for the most part, these are all the main glitches that were exclusive to Pokemon Emerald. A ton of Ruby and Sapphire bugs were patched upon the release of this game, but there are still a few left over that were either overlooked, or maybe they just didn't find them too important to change. So let's check out how much more we can screw this game up. Our first trick is going to be in Oldale Town. If we talk to this Pokemart worker, they'll walk us to the mart and then give us some tutorial info about buying items from the store, and they'll then give us a potion as a courtesy for listening to them. If your bag is filled to the point where you can't collect any more potions and new item slots, the game will give out the normal notification that you can't carry any more items. If we head up a little bit to Route 103 and then go back down to the mart, you'll notice that the worker's position wasn't reset back down to the bottom of the town. If you talk to them again, it will restart the event and then she'll slowly drag you into the woods. Thankfully because you're only one tile into the trees, you're not trapped and you can just walk back into the overworld. But if you were able to reach them again, the event would just keep looping like this over and over again. The whole bug happened solely because they didn't implement a flag that checks if the player has a full bag. Because it's supposed to be a tutorial for the beginning of the game, it's expected you complete this event, so I'm not totally surprised that this one was overlooked. To do the next one, we're going to need to have access to dive and head underwater to any cave entrance. The easiest one that you can do this with is a C4 cavern on Route 128. If you approach the doorway and press B at the right time, you'll hover over the doorway and you'll also be asked if you want to resurface. If you press yes, you'll teleport back to the overworld, but since there is a boulder in that location, the game doesn't put you back on your Pokemon, and instead you can just walk on the water. This really doesn't have any sort of benefit because you can surf way faster than you can run, 
but if we do this in a specific location, we can get a much different outcome. If the marine cave is located on Route 129, you can perform the same glitch. This time when we come back up, the game will push you out of bounds, so now you can access a whole new area of the map that you've never seen before. This glitch varies per save because the dive spot can be found in a few different locations. I tried a few times and each time it was in this location rather than the other, so the odds of being able to do this isn't guaranteed. Here's a glitch you can come across in just a normal playthrough. In the beginning of the game, you can meet your dad at Petalburg Gym, and you're tasked with following Wally into the grass to help him catch his first Pokemon. Although this entire event is scripted and you can do literally nothing but watch, there is one thing that isn't predetermined. The Pokemon stats. Although the game is scripted for Zigzagoon to attack twice, there is a chance that it's actually strong enough to knock out the Ralts. If the Zigzagoon is generated with an attack of 11, and the Ralts has a low defense nature with bad IVs, Wally will fail to catch it, and the battle will then end. The game continues as if he caught it anyways, so it doesn't change the game at all. But if this ever happens in your game, consider yourself lucky. If you add up all the little chances of all of this to happen, it comes out to a 1 in 8,574 chance, which is lower than encountering a shiny in this generation. Our next little bug is going to be in Rustboro City. If we head into the trainer's school, everything seems to be in order, right? Well, if we head back to the Pokemon Center and deposit some Pokemon into the 8th box in our PC, we can revisit the trainer's school and see that the windows have now of these dark black curtains. I believe the reason why this happens is because the first row of box 8 shares the same data ID as the corners of these windows due to an oversight. When you place Pokemon in that area, the Pokemon data overwrites the tile values, which then results in these vertical black lines. Although I called them curtains, it was just a convenient coincidence that the black bars appeared on the side of the window. Odds are this has been going on in your save file for years, and you've just never bothered to visit this building. The last exploit that we're going to take a look at in this video is one that could potentially be helpful if you ever wanted to play through these games again. The Hoenn Safari Zone has basically the same concept as the previous versions. You're given 30 Safari Balls and can freely roam and catch Pokemon until your step timer is expired. In this generation, they decided to make it a little more interesting by using Pokeblocks. If you go to these little stations in the grass, you can insert a Pokeblock color, which will then make all the Pokemon within a 5 tile radius have a nature that complements the Pokeblocks flavor. When you encounter a Pokemon, the game sets a flea rate and also a catch rate, which is just a chance that the Pokemon will run away or that you'll catch it after each turn. The catch rate is set to have a minimum value of 1, which means that the lowest catch rate the Safari Pokemon can possibly have is 5%. The concept was supposed to be implemented for the flea rate as well, but they made a small mistake in their values. If you throw a Pokeblock color that the wild Pokemon doesn't like, it will decrease the catch rate number. And because Game Freak knew that this could have issues if the value went into the negatives from using too many bad Pokeblocks, they implemented code that reverts the value back to 1 if the Pokeblocks will bring it to a negative value. The issue is that they didn't account for the fact that the player can still bring the value down to 0, which is coded to make the Pokemon have a 0% flea rate. This means if you throw the right amount of bad and good Pokeblocks, you can ensure that the Pokemon will never run away in battle. Although you probably zoned out through everything that I just said, if you know a Pokemon's catch rate and use this little diagram, according to Bulbapedia, you have a minimum 70% catch rate to catch any Pokemon you encounter with this method. This not only helps speed up encounters, but it could also potentially save you if you're an avid Safari Zone Shiny Hunter. And with that, we've successfully broken Pokemon Emerald inside and out. Although a lot of glitches in Pokemon Emerald didn't heavily impact the game in any way, the ones that do definitely compensate for them. I didn't know a majority of these even existed, and I thought it would be a good idea to bring light to how broken these games can really be. Once again, if there's a specific Pokemon game that you'd like me to cover glitches for, be sure to leave your ideas in the comment section below. If you're the top comment, I'll give you a shout out, and we'll figure out how far we can ruin your favorite game. Other than that, that's all there is to say about covering every glitch in Pokemon Emerald. And that's gonna do for today's video. If you liked the video, leave a like and consider subscribing, as I'll be making more content like this very soon. If you have any suggestions for videos that you'd like to see, leave a comment below. Follow me on Twitter to keep updated with new videos as they come out. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.